<laughs> so uh, ima imagine this: we're in we're in a uh, we're in the bar at the Nairobi airport, or what's left of it anyway, and uh, they announced that our planes are going to be four hours late, and so. We're all sitting there talking, and I end up sitting next to this guy, and I turn to him, and I go, the first idiotic thing that occurs to me is to say, geez, you look just like Jack Nicholson. <laughs> and he says, yeah, I get that a lot, and what's worse is my name is Jack. And we start talking and trading stories, and it turns out that um, he was a, a bomber pilot in World, War, in World War II, the Vietnam War. And he made a fortune in the crop dusting business, and now he wants to give back. And I say, well, how are you going to give back? And he goes, I'm going to throw mosquito nets out of a plane. And I'm like, oh, brother, I've, here we go. And we keep talking, and he says, he knows the literature. He knows that uh, in Western Kenya, every kid that sleeps in a net, the mortality rate has a 20% less chance of dying. He knows that free distribution is really the only way to get nets out there because people won't buy them. He knows that there's no real distribution channels in the kind of communities he cares about. It's like, well, we got to take this a little more seriously here. So, so I say, <clears throat> we got like three and a half hours left. So I say, well, do, let's do this. We got this way of looking at design for impact, design for scalable impact that's been really useful for our fellows and that I've worked with a lot of social entrepreneurs on. So we've got nothing better to do. Let's go through it. So we dive in. So the first thing we talk about is what's your mission? And in fact, this is the most important thing I talk to anybody about, is getting the mission straight before we launch into any conversation about what they do. And we don't find your normal mission statement very useful. <laughs> You've all seen this, right? So what we want to do is hone it down into eight words or less that include a verb, a target population and an outcome that implies something you might measure. And the thing to, to note about this is it's about the what you do. It's not about how you do it. And I work with social entrepreneurs all the time, and they want to launch into the how because that's what they think about from the moment they get up to the moment they fall asleep. But this is about the what. And we want to know the what first before we, as funders, have any conversation about what we might be looking at, or as someone who works with social entrepreneurs, what the rest of the conversation is going to be about. It's not your marketing statement. It's a, for design. So let me give you some examples. So island conservation is a group. Well, it turns out that most of the extinctions on the world are on islands. Most of those extinctions are caused by invasive predators. Island conservation is a group that clears off invasive predators, thereby saving species. Their mission is really clear. One Acre Fund, a lot of you might have heard of, um, they bundled together the various ingredients farmers need to scratch a better living out of a very small plot. Now, the extreme matters because it's very difficult to actually get all the way out of poverty on a one acre plot growing commodity crops in Africa. But extreme poverty is not having enough to eat and never having any money to save by. So that modifier is actually important to us in understanding what they do. Living Goods is an Avon lady-like network, a very dynamic saleswoman selling health products door to door in Uganda and doing health education at the same time. They've really focused on, on being responsible for this. And finally, Jack. Jack cares about this. And that's what becomes very clear very quickly in the, um, in the conversation with our fictional Jack. I see you looking mystified, so it's fictional. <laughs> um, so once we know that, now we're ready to talk about the how. And again, keeping it really simple, what we want to know is how are you going to do the what in a sentence or so? And what we find is people can't distill it down. I mean, this, this, this how is going to drive everything you do. It's going to organize everything you do. 
And we find that if we can't distill it down to a sentence, it might be too complicated. So here's some examples. I already spoiled the punchline in my intro of these groups, but eliminate energy's predators, training markets, training inputs and markets on credit, Avon ladylike, net, Avon ladylike network selling health products door to door. And then finally throw a mosquito nets out of a plane. <laughs> so the next thing is we know what you're going to do. We have a sense of how you're going to do it. The next very important thing we ask is if you could only measure one thing or if you could only know one thing to know if you've fulfilled that mission, what would it be? And this sometimes evokes sort of howls of outrage because it isn't that simple. But one, it often turns up the thing that you really ought to be measuring. And at the, always it turns up something important to design toward. So your just one thing is the thing that you're really designing towards. So again, these guys, island conservation looks at specific species and what happens when you clean off the predators. One Acre Fund measures income. What they really do is they measure the increase in crop yield and what that would be worth in the given year's commodity prices. Living Goods really measures child mortality and just did so with a big RCT. And then <clears throat> he's going to try to figure out malaria cases averted. This is so important because not just because of measurement, but this is really what you're designing toward. And when you think about Impact, impact comes from people doing something differently. It comes from behavior. So going back just a touch, though, one other angle to understand impact is to think about measuring it. We find that often really illuminates impact and fills it out and, and um, makes it a little clearer what to do with it. So we think there's four things you need to know to measure your impact well. The first is know your mission, so we've already gone through that. The second is measuring the right thing. We've talked a little bit about that. The third is get good quality numbers that persuasively show that there was a change. And the last is kind of the hardest, which is make sure it was you or attribution. Because your impact is the difference between what happened with you and what would have happened without you. And you have to make that subtraction to really know. So getting good numbers, there are technical people who can always help you with this. But the first is, when do you measure? So if you've got a new model and it's iterating fast and constantly changing, it's not time to measure impact. You've got to wait till that thing stabilizes so you know what you're measuring. Giving it the right intervals, so you give it a chance to work and um, show impact is really important. Getting a big enough sample size, you got something statistically significant, really important. And how the survey method you use, asking the right questions to the right people in the right way. There are probably experts in this room who can do this a million times better than I can. You take those kind of people to lunch and they'll help you out with this. But the tough one is attribution. And like everything, we've tried to make it as simple as we can for our own sakes, if nothing else. And we've, we've thought about it as there being three levels. And the first is what we call narrative attribution. And that's when the story is so straightforward, you can't think of any other reason or there's no other conceivable reason that might have led to the result. So this is an island off the Mexican coast. On the right is no goats. On the left is goats still around. There's nothing else to explain that difference. We give all the credit to island conservation. The attribution is easy. With one acre fund, it's a little more complicated because what might happen in a uh, given year has everything to do with rainfall, commodity crops, pests, whatever. You need to compare it to something. So what they do trying to be affordable is they match it to s farmers in very similar areas where they're going next and compare the two side by side. And then when they've, <clears throat> as soon as they can, they move into the, 
the area, but these farmers are as close together as they can. It ain't perfect. It's not like a randomized controlled trial. It is simple enough for an organization to do again and again and again in setting after setting. Now, when you start dealing with something like child mortality, there are so many factors that affect that. The numbers are fairly, the, the, um, the incidence of it is relatively low. You gotta do something more complicated. That's when you need to randomize, because you need two groups that look as close to each other as you possibly can get. So what they did was they took a bunch of villages in Uganda and randomly assigned them to get a living goods health promoter or not. So now you have a pool of villages that in aggregate look like each other. And the answer is pretty convincing. What we try to do when we are measuring impact in general is what's the simplest, how can we drive it toward the narrative attribution or do we have to get more complicated? And we always do the simplest we can. Thinking through that kind of helps you understand your impact just that much better. So, impact comes from behavior. It comes from somebody doing something differently. If nobody does anything different, then no impact happens. And a lot of what we do comes from the thinking through what behavior has to change to get the impact you're trying to have. And one of the tools we use is we create a behavior map, or we call it behavior mapping. So here, here's an example. A ton of people have tried to solve this problem of getting micronutrients into kids through commodity foods like cassava flour, maize porridge, whatever. And it's hard to do, and one of the, one of the parts of it that um, people have looked a lot at is how do you actually mix it evenly and easily? So I was working with this team of business students and engineering students from Stanford in this interesting class called Design for Extreme Affordability. And they were making this device. And in fact, the device, they did a really good job. It turned out this device measured really evenly and was cheap and was a, was a, they fulfilled the assignment they were given by their NGO partner really well. So we said, okay, to get to the impact we're looking for, healthier kids, who has to do what? So we start with the miller. The miller's got to get the thing. That's a supply chain. He's got to get the other thing, another supply chain that has to be coordinated. He's got to mix it in. Now you're worried about fraud. He's got to sell a fortified flour. This guy's been selling one thing his whole working life, and now he's got a new product he needs to market and sell, and maybe it's going to cost a little bit more. The parents, on the other hand, they got to buy a new premium product and they got to feed it to the kids and not every culture do the kids get the best. And then of course the kids have to eat it, which means it's got to taste exactly like what they're used to. So we looked at that list and we said, can this NGO partner make all that stuff happen even conceivably? And we looked at the partner, and they were good at some stuff, but they couldn't even begin to pull all this stuff together. So a behavior map kind of showed us that this wasn't going to happen. This product kind of needed to be put on the shelf for now. If an organization or a coalition of organizations can put all this together, maybe it's useful. But the behavior map kind of helped us show this was too much. So we look at, we, uh, we go back to old Jack, and we say, what's, what's your map look like? So, and this is, once again, this is like back of the, this is napkin stuff. It's just a starting point. But if he wants to get to malaria averted, one way of looking at it is the villagers got to find the net after he throws it out of the plane. They got to take it to a home instead of somewhere else. They got to get the parents to, the parents have to hang it up properly and they have to put the kids in it. And they have to put the kids in it at the right time, depending on when the mosquitoes are, are uh, that particular species of Anopheles is, is biting. So we look at that and we say, okay, what would you do about it? And that's where our next step comes in, and we call it intervention matching. Um, 
And so intervention matching is taking each one of those behaviors and saying, well, what the hell would we do about it? Let's make a list. Let's start brainstorming on a list of what we might do about it. So we get that list going. Okay, villager finds a net. Villager finds a net. Okay, what should we do? Well, if there's, if there's awareness of the net, the drop beforehand, well, that makes it more likely that it'll work. Maybe you make them bright orange. That'll help. Um, there's always something mobile you can do, right? In these days, you always have to ask that question. <laughs> and then, so trying to get somebody, making sure somebody takes it home. One thing, maybe use the same radio show to let people know they have a right to a net and that they shouldn't let anybody they know take it off and sell it or whatever, although there's no market for nets, really. And maybe you drop a few extra, flood the place. Maybe you... Um, well, maybe you think of some other stuff. And then the parent hanging it properly, well, maybe you design the net so it's really hard to hang wrong. And maybe the packaging has such great instructions that it's hard to hang it wrong. And maybe you talk about it on the radio, how to hang it up right. And then getting the kids in it, once again, the packaging can just make it clear that maybe you can get that point across in the packaging. You're going to use the radio. And maybe there are some health workers that can start going around and, and checking to see. So this is just an initial list, but now we have some interventions to match this whole thing. And we can start thinking about which of these are stupid, which of these are smart, what other ideas that sort of generates. But we start developing this sort of inventory of interventions. And what we want to do with that is then systematically, we've done our brainstorming, but going back to the behaviors, we want to ask this more systematic question of conditions and incentives. Have we made it so it can happen? And have we made it so that it will happen? And maybe the best approach to that is also to be thinking about will it last? Because if we want to create lasting impact, we need to look at these. And it's often pretty clear if you look at the incentive structure, for example, this isn't going to last. This is going to be somebody's got a small fund, they're going to expend it, and it's going to be gone. So just by looking systematically at this stuff, you can answer some really important questions. And another way to take the same conditions and incentives thing is to say, you know, and you read books like Switch and Nudge, and they're really smart about all this stuff. Make it as easy as possible. Make it so it's, it's easier to, to do it than not. And tap demand instead of trying to create demand whenever you can. And those are the two things we've probably found most useful about conditions and incentives. So with all that, then you're ready to start. Oh, oh, one thing that's super important then. You've got all these interventions, and you're trying to think, how would I put that into a systematic model that's simple enough for anybody to ever do? One thing that really helps you sort that is thinking about what your eventual path to scale is, because I know everybody in this room doesn't want to do anything unless it hits a million people. So <laughs> you have to think about there's only really four ways to get to scale. One is what we call the DIY, do it yourself. You either you either create a really big NGO, you create a really big business, or you have some internet or mobile platform that people that can really go to scale in a more viral, self-replicating kind of way. Now, there's obvious problems with each of those. Um, getting an NGO large enough to, to have that kind of impact means you're endlessly raising money and managing. A big business can be the same way, and there are not that many big businesses that actually can answer to the needs of the population Mulago is interested in, which is the, the, uh, the poorest. And I'm, I've not been, I think there's, it's harder to get some of these platforms to do what you hope they do than people think. But it's one way. Another way is, if you've got the right solution, getting lots of NGOs to replicate it. We probably all know how hard it is to get one NGO to replicate another NGO's innovation, which some people are working hard to fix and some funders are working hard to help drive, but it's problematic. There's industry, and notice I say industry instead of a business. 
the thing that goes to scale is a bunch of businesses competing. And what we like to do whenever we make an impact investment, for example, is say, are we investing in a one-off or are we investing in something that might stimulate a, an industry? And then finally, there's government. And we all know that government has the heft and the mandate and the bandwidth to do great big things. And we all know the problems with trying to move something through government. So looking at all your interventions, potential interventions, kind of sorting them out, and then looking at how you eventually want to go to scale helps you figure out then what a model might look like. And I'm just going to use a simplified version of One Acre Fund's model just to kind of take you through it. One Acre Fund has three, sometimes four, big behaviors that they want to change. They want to get people to sign up for loans. They want to get them to use inputs better. Uh, they want to get them to use inputs at all, and they want to use them right when they do that. They want to use, get people to use better farming techniques, and sometimes they want to get them to grow different crops. So they need to then take all the things that it takes to get people able and willing to do those behaviors and all the interventions that make sense to do them and put it into a model that can really take off. So in in a very business-like fashion, they start with recruiting farmer groups, they sign people in those up for loans, they do some initial training, they distribute the inputs to them, they support them through the cycle, which turns out to be super important. You can't just train them once. They make sure there's a market for their produce and they collect repayment. They do that again and again and again. They do that really efficiently and they do that in multiple countries and they do that to about 200,000 farming families now. It's a scalable model. So, when we get to a place where we feel like we have an initial model, what we want to do is something we call a scalability audit. Taking what we know about the common themes about what turns out to be scalable and applying them to what we see of a model and saying, okay, can this dog hunt? And <clears throat> the first is, does it have real impact? Because there's no point in scaling anything that doesn't have real impact. We do a lot of startup stuff. And thinking about impact there is looking at the behaviors, the interventions in the model and saying, do we buy it? Do we really think that what they propose to do will change those behaviors in a lasting way? Is it cheap enough? Cost effectiveness, if it costs too much, it can never scale. Is it replicable? Is it simple, systematic, broadly adaptable enough that it can be done again and again? And a kind of a good test is if somebody else can do it. If it's only you who can do it, it's probably too complicated. Is it designed for the specific path to scale? So you picked one, and sometimes you pick a combination of them. Sometimes they come in, um, they come in stages. But your eventual path to scale, is this designed for it? Like if it's going to go through, say, remote government health clinics, it better be simple and bomb-proof. So when you go back and look at it, will it go to scale in, in the specific path that you hope it will? Does it fit? Did it get designed for that? And so here's our really fundamental four thing list of what we go through to get to what we think will be a scalable model. And the reason I bolded the first three is because they're everything. You get those wrong, you fail. You can't accomplish what you hope to if you don't know what it is. And the better, more tightly def you define what it is, the more likely you're going to end up with a coherent model. And if you get very specific about your impact, you can design that much more tightly toward it. And the final thing is iterate. Nobody's business plan, nobody's model, nothing's really ready for prime time out of the gate. In fact, you may change your, your, your fundamental idea. You may even change your mission. But 
everything from your mission, your model, your way of, of uh, executing, your business plan, your M&E system, all that needs to constantly be iterated, but most fundamentally, your model. So that's it. Applause. <laughs> So we tried to burn through that, so we had time for questions and arguments and whatever. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Julian. I'm with Engineers Without Borders. Um, the Lager Foundation is really committed to the idea of scalability. Do you think all projects should, um, should have scalability in mind, or do you think there are initiatives that that's not how they should respond to the social issue? No, that's what we do. And boutique projects are great, as long as you know what you're getting into and you don't end up thinking you're going to scale and having more a non-scalable project. There's tons of totally worthwhile things that aren't scalable. I just think you should know which one you're involved in. The examples, sorry, the examples that you give are um, tend to be focused on organizations that have direct services or programs that they're implementing. How does it apply for those of us that are running organizations that are more network or knowledge-based organizations where there isn't sort of a direct service um, or product that we're implementing? Well, the first thing, and, and I talk about this with advocacy organizations as well, is one, who do you want to do what differently? And then the other is, if you have a service, you know, if you have like your, you know, the, your um, valuable design service to give somebody, you're like us as a foundation. You're an investor. So in essence, their impact is your impact. And our foundation, for example, we have zero impact unless the people we fund have impact. And so that's how I think of, of our impact. And I would suggest that when you have a valuable commodity that you are in fact laying on an organization, then looking at the, trying to look at what the delta is between their impact with you and without you is at least really worth thinking about if extremely difficult to really measure in a rigorous way. Yeah, when you're the sort of working at that metal level, it, it gets trickier. So, for example, we have a we have a, a philanthropic portfolio, and each each organization in that portfolio has their own. We only fund people who measure impact, so at least we have a sense over time if it's happening. How do we know what our impact is? It's sort of looking at our whole portfolio, and over time, are we are we funding organizations that are able to document impact? The, it, for us, we're able to often calculate what the cost per impact is so we could actually have a direct sense of what our money does. But in general, having a portfolio approach to that where at least in every, um, every organization, for example, a design outfit might work with, you know are they succeeding in their mission. And if it turns out that one out of 10 that you work with is not having impact, well, then all of you have a problem. Yes, please. Sorry, hi, Ann May Chang from Mercy Corps. Um, I was interested in uh, looking at the word iterate up there, and you mentioned earlier, um, and I completely agree that iteration is absolutely important. You also mentioned that um, you want to measure impact after the iteration sort of slows down. But to me, that seems a little bit of a dichotomy because it's you, you sort of want to have the impact drive the iteration, right? Otherwise, right. how do you know right. when, when you are done iterating or when do you know like which things are working and not? So I'm curious yeah. if you could talk about that. So we've thought a lot about that. And and if you think of organizations, most of them, 
Most of them go through something that looks like the social sector organizations. There's an idea phase where you don't have anything on the ground yet. You're doing your best to figure out what you're going to do. And then there's an R&D phase where you got stuff going on the ground and you're trying to figure out what really is our model and how does it work. And then you have what you, I hope you have, what we call a proof of impact phase where you've kind of got the model figured out. Um, it's that iteration curve is kind of stabilized and you're doing something a little more rigorous. You're following sort of the principles I talked about. And then you're doing a limited replication phase to see, is this thing look like it's scalable? And then finally, it's ready to take off and go to scale. And in each of those phases, you take a little bit different approach to measuring. So in that first stage of R&D, you're doing that sort of lean startup, fast fail -y kind of stuff where you're constantly doing small experiments and getting as uh, good a feel for whether this thing might have impact as you can. And then when it gets, when the model sort of stabilizes and you kind of know what it is, you try to set up a more rigorous trial. Maybe not a big expensive RCT, but something that makes a persuasive case that this thing is worth growing a little bit. When you get back to that early replication, maybe you get back to quick experiments again to see how you scale this thing up. And then when things are ready to take off, that's when it makes sense to do these big expensive studies because you're now, you and hopefully by now others, are going to put a lot into this. And there is a cautionary tale with um, microfinance, of course. So microfinance, nobody thought for a long time to measure whether people became wealthier as a result of taking these loans. And so it really scaled up into the hundreds of millions of dollars and I don't know how far beyond. But when they finally got around to it, the thing had scaled. And what they found, and I've talked to, this is, this is kind of a, it's a very ballpark, but I talked to a number of, of microfinance economists about it. It turned out that about 25% of people really did get out of poverty, were a lot better off. 50% were, had shock seized a little bit, their cash flows were evened out, but basically they were more or less in the same place. And the kicker was that 25% of people were worse off. Because these loans are expensive, unless you have something really smart to do with it, you could end up in the hole. So, we kind of learned from that that it, before the thing really takes off, that's when you ought to be doing these rigorous trials and it's worth spending a couple hundred grand on them to make sure you're not trying to scale up something that really doesn't work as well as you'd hoped. It's been figuring out specific questions and then coming up with a methodology as cheaply as possible to, to answer those questions. So for example, uh, I don't know if there's in, probably not in here, ID Insight was working with IDE in Cambodia. And the question came up, they're trying to, they're trying to get people to adopt toilets, to actually buy latrines, good, good quality latrines. And this question comes up, um, would people buy, buy them more if, if we had financing for them? So pretty quickly they set up a number of centers and they randomized them. It wasn't a big sample size, but it was like, like a dozen sales centers. Randomly assigned them to either offer financing or not. Very quickly saw that they got like a 50% uptake. That's almost a more complicated version of what I'm talking about. I can't really come, nothing comes to mind immediately. I'll, um, but there's, there's, the good organizations are constantly doing experiments that don't even get called maybe formal experiments. Way back there. Hey, uh, my name is Taylor Downs from Vera Solutions, and, and just on that, that last point and thinking of like really yeah, small experiments. Yeah, answer the other questions for me too. <laughs> Um, we, we work with a, a client in East Africa, Synergy, 
Dave's hanging out over there right now. And uh, a lot of the a lot of the stuff they did early on. And Dave, if I get this completely wrong, apologies. Um, but they were doing basically A/B testing, where they'd have like real-time data coming in from uh, their their sanitation networks, and they would just simply like you know it didn't have to be big experimental design outside consultant. They would just uh, use different messaging. Right, and they track like, can we drive more users to the toilet if it's you know if if the outside's painted blue or painted yellow? I know they're all blue, but y you get the idea. And and so, <laughs> so so they were they were able to do like micro experiments, and then just like it doesn't it doesn't have to be statistically significant, you know. You just need like good information coming in in like lots and lots of frequency, and then you can make a change and do another A/B test with like the better of those, the better of the results from the first A/B test. That was a brilliant presentation, by the way. Thank you. But the many organizations I meet work, I'm Tracy Jackson Kaguri from Uganda. And many organizations I meet in Uganda are started by passionate people who care about their communities and want to provide a service. They don't know all the stuff you are talking about here. When you are selecting organizations to work with, do they already know about how to measure impact, or do you teach them how to do it after you select them? A combination of, a combination of both. And um, even, even a lot of the, uh, all organizations can, could use to take another hard look at it this year and next year and the next year. And for us, what, I'm kind of thinking about from the funding perspective, what makes a huge difference to us is whether people are curious and whether to be skeptical about their own impact and even want to talk about it. And the best organizations have a culture of curiosity and skepticism and iteration um, and wanting constantly to improve and wanting the information they need to improve. Because remember, Measuring impact is about getting better at what you do first. You know, pleasing the funder should be a distant, distant second for it. You package whatever you need to for the funders. But what it really is for is for you. So we, one of the reasons we tried to make it simple is so that we can start working with really early stage organizations and start to embed this stuff as early as we can. And one real watershed for us is whether an organization thinks it's interesting and embraces it right out of the starting gate or not. When there's real resistance to it, it'd be like meeting a company that has a real resistance to establishing an accounting department. If, you, if you've had your hand up for a while, just yell, because it's hard to keep track of. Yes? So really great presentation, uh, but you left me hanging with like a burning question here, which is after four hours in the airport with Jack, what did he decide to do? Oh, Most well, efficient ways to drop him out that's of a plane. such a good question. I actually was going to mention that. So we got to the scale up question. Jack's idea originally was to have you know, an army of his pilot buddies do this. And the scale up question just really stymied him. And he said, I got to have some more time to think about this. Because the obvious thing is somehow to get government to do it. But then he started looking at that set of potential interventions. And he think, could that, could that work? So we finally got in our plans. He promised to call. I'm waiting for it. Chris Isaac with AgDevCo. We're a social impact investor. We look for scale. Uh, I was wondering what you think success looks like. What is the success rate of any every 10 organizations you would support? How many would you be expecting would be able to get to scale? That's an interesting question. So one thing to frame that, what we're looking for is eventually a curve that looks like this. Not a straight line, but something that looks exponential over time. That can take a while. Organizations doing everything right can stay on that relatively flat part for quite a long time. 
you have to have a lot more patience for extended R&D with new ideas and badly functioning markets. Um, but here's, here's, you know, being from San Francisco, we're near Silicon Valley, you end up talking to a lot of VCs, and they're saying, well, we expect out of 21 to go big, or you know, maybe even one out of 10. Well, that's partly because in Silicon Valley, all the obvious great ideas have already been vacuumed up, and people are coming up with all kinds of stuff on the margin. <laughs> In the social sector, there's good ideas abandoned after successful pilots lying all over the place. And what you need is somebody super capable to pick one up and run with it. I don't know where we're going to get to really getting to that curve. If we use a, a million people who've you know, not been touched or something, but a million people who've really benefited significantly from given intervention, we ain't got much so far. And even a superstar roster like uh, Skoll, we don't have much so far. The social entrepreneur thing is new. Um, we don't really know what it's going to do. But if I look at movement through these stages to scale, I'd say we got 80% or better. And the problem, the fundamental problem is not the solutions of the organizations. It's a totally dysfunctional donor market. There's no real market for impact. You can have killer impacts. And it doesn't have a differential effect in and of itself on your fundraising. So until we fix that problem, we're going to be more or less, we're not going to anywhere near achieve the potential of these great ideas and these great people. Yes. I would like to talk about, if, if you could reflect from your experiences, not just the products and the services, but the impact on cultures and designing for communities to, for our communities to solve the problems themselves. Um, maybe a reflection on what you've seen works and what you've seen that doesn't work. That would be a long one. but. Communities doing it themselves is sometimes treated as an end in and of itself. And to us, it's just a way of, it's just a kind of behavior. And it may be that what you're looking for to get to a given impact is communities organize and do X. And when communities organize well, you know, you, you've all seen communities organize to do something and then they don't ever do anything again or the whole organization falls apart and it's all in the nature of the organization and whether the or that um, behavior is really supported by the conditions and incentives that will keep it going. So I don't know if I have anything really general to say about that except that things that are driven with intrinsic uh, values and cultures, uh, cultural values, and local methods and local knowledge, they tend to be more stable. If you think about incentives, there's kind of this range. And it goes from coercive on one end to self-reinforcing, satisfying on another end with maybe compensated right in the middle. And the coerced is the least stable. You know, you got to keep fencing the guys out and, and having guards continuously. To self-reinforcing, where if you, somebody adopts the behavior, they're, they're almost certainly going to continue it. A lot of these more internally driven um, things that tap uh, local knowledge and, and uh, values, they tend to be more on that stable side. I'm going to just work my way over from this side. Yes, please. Examples. You don't have to name the organizations, but of, of actually how the behavior mapping has worked in practice and the intervention mapping. Like I'm wondering if sometimes people present to you, as a doctor would say, with a, a sort of feasible sounding plan, but it turns out actually that when you map the behaviors carefully, they've missed some that turn out to be fatal yeah. or that you can't or you put in it, the, the intervention that you would need is you know, prohibitively expensive or they can't find it. I, know, I just wonder sort of a bit how it kind of plays out in practice. 
Well, yeah, I won't mention any specific ones, like he suggested. <laughs> but um, first of all, sometimes with really smart people, getting to the eight-word mission statement alone takes two hours. Or maybe it never happens, which usually means it's just not a fit. Getting the thing we're really designing toward, sometimes after you get that first part right, it happens pretty quick, but sometimes that takes a long time. So often there's never been any real formal thinking about the behaviors needed to get to that. There was more a, an idea about how, and then smart people just continually tried to, to develop that idea. So often this idea of saying, what are all the behaviors you need? And not necessarily in a chain, what are all some, some contributing things as well? It's the first time most organizations have ever done anything like that. And often something jumps out that either is a big opportunity or was a deal killer, potentially. But that, that we, we just find, like we do a lot of startups and so we have to do that behavior mapping because we have to try and predict impact, which is harder even than measuring it. Who do we have over here, back in that corner? Yes, sir, uh, Eli Williams and um, Home Foundation out of Chicago. One, one of the things that and, and, uh, we struggle with even, one of the things that we struggle with even at the uh, McCormick Foundation is having an eight word mission statement is great for philanthropy. It's also great to build internal buy-in as to what you're doing, but isn't there the risk that by having eight word mission stating, by having a verb, a target, and an outcome, that you may miss some of the other opportunities of impact that you're actually making? So you use the example of microfinance, and you said that you know 25% people are doing better, 50% people are doing the same, and 25% are doing worse. But maybe the real interaction is that there was no marketplace for that to happen in the first place. And those 25% are actually hiring a lot more people. So they're having a tremendous amount of impact in the environment. But the original mission statement is, you know, and I'll just make something up, provide you know, uh, credit to people who normally wouldn't get credit. But the actual outcome is that's not what you started off with. So again, my question is, is there a, a risk that by defining it very simply, that you miss out on some of the other outcomes that are just as important, if not more important? Yeah, such a good question. The answer is yes initially, and if you pay attention, no. And it sounds like you just sort of restated the mission back to, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, give credit to people who wouldn't otherwise have it. And that was what they did. And to us, that mission is what got them into a lot of trouble. Give people access to credit to what end is the question we're always asking. You, you want to do this thing toward what end? And so this never, it doesn't capture everything. And everything we do, like when you measure child mortality, what you're really measuring is the tip of an iceberg. If child mortality goes down significantly, it meant Morbidity went down a lot. It means adults are probably healthier. A lot happened. But you, you caught the most important leader that really um, both implies everything else and allows you to design better toward it. So we, we get that question a lot. And as you go down the path, it may turn out that you want a different mission statement. But the more specific you are, the more you'll know where you're headed. And if it has a real outcome, it helps you stay out of trouble. By the way, if anybody has an answer to somebody else's question, just put your hand up or yell or something. Oh, I think I promised to work through that way. Yes, please. I'm just wondering how you feel about uh, social change that has a long time scale. For instance, we're working in education, and uh, you know, for secondary education, it's slightly closer to the end result we want, which is for young people to be able to have the skills to get a good job or to create their own jobs. But we also look at primary education too, uh, and we know that you know 
that's going to take a lot of years and funders aren't prepared to sort of uh, you know wait wait 10 years for us to be able to kind of say what what the impact was um would you kind of, you know how do you feel about you know that as a, a thing in itself but also the use of sort of proxy indicators if we can kind of show some clear achievements in a short scale time scale that we believe will learn to uh, longer term changes again it's just a critically important question and I'm going to answer it from the investor point of view because that's really helped us think through this thing. So at some point, you've got to decide this is worth investing in. So education, you can go down the rabbit hole. Right? You can start thinking about all the life effects of education and think, well, we don't know what effect this has until we've already gotten down there. Well, there's plenty. There's a huge body of literature showing how valuable an education is. So in the Lago Foundation, for example, we just decided primary education is an endpoint, is an impact that we will, we will fund. And we don't try to take it any further. We decided that already. We decided that helping people make more money is something that's worth doing. We actually decided that getting houses lit up is something worth doing. There's a big body of evidence showing all the benefits over time of these things, all the indirect benefits, so we bought it. And I, I don't think any of us should tell anybody else what's worth doing. I just think it's really important to say what you're doing. And as far as the proxies go, we kind of think of it as you got a model, you deliver your model, behavior changes, and you get impact. And the impact may be long-term, but you, you measure the behavior as soon as you can. You certainly measure the delivery as soon as you do it. So there's all kinds of, pro we do a lot of, we do conservation even. When do you know when that's happened? But you do know what behaviors are destructive and you can start measuring those behaviors as proxies for eventual conservation. So we often try to use behavior as a proxy. It might be a proxy that allows the time span it might allows you to, it allows you to measure something sooner, or in some cases, it might even be a proxy for the impact, like um, there was that study in Western Kenya that showed that with kids sleeping in mosquito nets, mortality went down 20%. So a study that was looking at distributing mosquito nets through prenatal care clinics, they wanted to know its effect on child mortality. They didn't actually have to measure child mortality, which is really hard to do. They needed to peek in huts and see if kids were in nets, which is a very simple thing to do. Here we go. Uh, Maria Galter with Africade. We work in Tanzania with uh, girls empowerment. So we're working with teen girls and doing uh, personal uh, growth and leadership uh, development uh, training. Um, so some of the cha behavior change that we are hoping to see is, you know, increased self-confidence. So it's some of these more uh, intangibles. Um, so the question then is, um, you know, how how do we, and, and sometimes those changes are so subtle and it's in the way a girl stands or in the way a girl enters the room or how she addresses, um, you know, a room of people. Um, so, you know, how, how do we measure those kinds of intangibles? Uh, so that's one question. The other question is, um, does Mulago Foundation have anything to do with Mulago Hospital in Kampala? Oh, <laughs> the first one's way easier, so I'll take that one. So, um, very briefly, uh, Mulaga Foundation is in the memory of and the legacy of a guy named Reiner Arnhold, who was a pediatrician at UC San Francisco, um, who died in the 90s. And he had worked for years in various humanitarian crises, and he actually taught at Mulago Hospital for a long time. It turned out he came from a banking family, and so he created his own foundation that he didn't really tell anybody about called Malago Foundation, so it got resurrected after he died. <laughs> the second question is a little trickier. Um, 
We think of a lot of those things like empowerment. I kind of, when I, when I think about empowerment, what I'm really thinking about is somebody's now able to solve problems for themselves in a way that lasts. And so that is a step on the way to impact. But if empowerment doesn't lead to measurable impact in something that they're doing, I don't quite know what it is. And, and we think of the kinds of things you're talking about are critical parts of maintaining the behaviors that create impact. If they don't create impact that somebody can observe, I get scared sometimes that they will peak and not less. What good is confidence if it doesn't actually allow you to have impact in your own life? But how critical it is if you do have impact to maintaining your ability to have that impact. Please, Willie. Uh, yeah, Willie Foot. <clears throat> uh, two questions, root capital. First one, um, back to the beginning, kind of make sure it was you. So understood attribution, you know, what happened with you, what happened without you. When you get later on in your evolutionary cycle and you maybe start to, in, to uh, stimulate an industry, how do you think about additionality vis-a-vis um, -vis maybe you not being the problem as you're stimulating that industry and you're growing yourself and how you're additional to the other players or other players out there in the industry? Uh, the second question is around multiple impacts. So uh, I, I'm really just building on the, the last question. So. In our case, we're investing in agricultural businesses that grow prosperity for rural communities, for farm households. But there are all sorts of cross-cutting impacts around women in agriculture, around climate smart agriculture, around food security and nutrition, among post-conflict, post-disaster. Do we poo-poo that, or is that just, in some cases, your impact is multidimensional, even if you have a, an absolute spear point, which is around people making more money? Yeah. I'll take that last one first. So you're working with poor people. Poor people are poor because they don't have any money. You're trying to help them make more money. A lot of the other things are critically important steps on the way once you've identified what you have to do for them. You know, for example, the coffee co-op has to get better at what they do. You have to you have to be able to demonstrate that. Actually, what are some of the what are some of the additional kinds of things you're talking about? Of women or climate smart act? Yeah, so, so we're, we're talking about. about yeah, so like massively being. scaling um, agronomic practices that, are, that make farmers more resilient to erratic weather. Okay, that's right? behavior. Good. Yeah. So, so in the case of, of, uh, of women, where you have a highly gender inclusive business that is either employing a lot more women in a processing plant than they would otherwise, or it's shea butter and it's 100% women and you want to blow that industry out. Uh, or there are services like internal credit, micro lending through a farmer enterprise to women for income diversification like honey or poultry or whatever. Yeah. So that would be something where maybe it's not what you set out originally, but it's a critical aspect, contour of the impact of the business. And yet still, if you went to just that one single impact, you're looking at are they making more money when actually at the end of the day, maybe what you did, given that women spend 50% 50 50 more of any dollar on family and housing and health, that that was actually more important than actually making more money for a, in, in a family's pocket. Well, one way that might be interesting to look at that is you're a portfolio organization. You've got one, um, you finance one organization after another, and each of those may end up having a subtly different mission. It may be in one, it's super important. This one, the mission is about um, get additional income to women. And you design and you aim toward that. Another one is um, help f farmers in a given crop make more money. And it turns out that in that, for whatever reason, it's the men. And you're not worried about gender in that one. Or for whatever reason, you're not worried about gender. But giving very specific about the mission of your financing in each each element of your portfolio might be a really useful way to use that endpoint um, to help you get there. I'm not even sure I can remember your first question. Additionality. But so, in other words, how do you avoid becoming distortionary? 
in a market when you've helped to stimulate it and then some maybe stay too long in that market if it gets uptake from private sector where other folks get crowded in who are doing something the same. Maybe that's too nuanced, but it's, a, it's an issue that we, we're, we're dealing with. We try to stimulate a smaller finance industry. Well, I think that what you what you demonstrate at the beginning is that providing finance to people that otherwise wouldn't have had it created impact that wouldn't have otherwise happened. If a bunch of other, if having done that, if a bunch of other people step in and do it, that's just going to scale. That's the jackpot. So I'm not sure I would, if I'm understanding it, I'm not sure I would even worry about it. You won. Please. Hi, uh, Michael Jenkins from Forest Trends. And um, I, I wanted to first um, kind of debate something you said, which is the only impact you have is through your grantees. Because having been a donor for a long time, your impact, you're like a, you're like a train station. You see all the stuff coming in. So this kind of a conversation and to be able to share what you're learning through your, your grantees, your, your portfolio projects, others is really, really important. So don't, don't belittle that. I mean, that's really a, a value to the community. But I also wanted to think again about, and I think this was a question that was asked a little bit earlier, which is, you said it, you know, the donor sector is dysfunctional, and, and I would agree. And, and it's, it's, it's not connected at all. You've got foundations out here. You've got people calling themselves impact investors. You've got, you know, a whole suite of folks that are, that are, there's no continuum there if you're a project that needs to move along that continuum. But I'm wondering if, from your perspective, are there innovations you guys are doing that are going to help you with that curve you were talking about? Do you provide 10 years of finance to somebody? Do you think about the, the array of tools that you might have at your disposal, which could include grants, which could include investments, which could include um, you know, different types of investments? Is that, is that an innovation that you guys are bringing to the table to mirror to change that dysfunctionality? Do you, do you have the, the bandwidth to do that kind of stuff? Well, I'm, uh, I don't know what effect we really have, but what we, we just try to come up with the best way we can fund. And if others find it useful, that's great. And I'm not, I'm not I appreciate what you said a lot. But, um, and if you, if you want more detail on how we fund, Kristen Gillis is, is one of the people who really helps drive it at Milago. Um, but what we do is we do unrestricted funding only. We never do restricted funding. We don't fund project, we don't fund programs, only unrestricted core funding. If we don't trust you enough to give you unrestricted funding, we shouldn't be funding in the first place. We stay with things. If, we're st if we believe we're seeing progress along that curve, we'll stay with you for a decade. We recruit other funders. We don't take proposals. We think that they're largely a waste of time for us and other people, and I'm far too lazy to read them. We have a network and we go hunting. And we gather our own information by and large. And a lot of our close funding partners do, do the same. And we, are, we do have a, uh, increasingly, we have a group of fellow funders. We actually gave it some structure and called it Big Bang Philanthropy. I and mean, so it is a set of about a dozen like-minded funders who are all focused on scalable impact in the lives of the very poor. So that's our approach. We love to tell people about it. We don't assume it's the only approach. Who knows, maybe it's not even the best approach. But I feel like the biggest responsibility you have as a funder is to be accountable for impact and then develop the best strategy you can to get there. We got five minutes. Who's? Uh, hi, Andrean from Solidaridad. Um, we were in a session earlier today where we talked about this kind of gap where a lot of us are working on ideas that um, are too risky for traditional financiers, investors to take on, but too commercial for traditional philanthropic actors uh, to invest because there's actually a return on investment, but it might be like 3%, for example. And we're seeing, and we talked about needing to have blends of philanthropy and then for profit investors come in. A lot of examples in agriculture, but in other sectors. And I was wondering both where where do you stand and how do you deal with that? And do you help certain 
nonprofits transition towards a for fully for profit model? Yep. So we luckily get to be completely agnostic as to whether something's for profit or not for profit. We're focused if it has impact, then we can fund it. It turns out that in the sector we work in, in, in our focus area, which is the basic needs of the very poor, our portfolio ends up looking 90% philanthropy, 10% investing. Um, we think that if an idea looks like it might go big via the market, but it's got a lot of R&D to sort it out, there's not a really dialed in business model yet. We don't really know if there's a for-profit, uh, viable for-profit there in the kind of markets where we operate. We will happily fund it as a not-for-profit until it's either proven that this dog will hunt or it won't, and then work with them to flip it into a for-profit and then fund whatever they need afterward. Um, and I hope that's kind of the wave of the future in things that are very innovative. Because I work with a ton of social entrepreneurs who launch as for-profits with what they hope are high impact models and they get a little bit of angel funding and they work their ass off and they're not quite to where they would have a viable business yet and then no investor in their right mind would fund them so they just fall off a cliff. So I'm actually, if it really, really has impact for the target population, I used to think it was really bad if somebody made money eventually off our grants. And I work for very smart bankers, and it kind of still kind of sticks in their craw sometimes. But I think of it as a home run now. I really do. Yes? Uh, yeah, just really quickly, I guess. Um, uh, you mentioned you know, the, the hole in the, in the funding landscape. I don't know if this is on or not. But, uh, um, and you know, the fact that you can actually deliver a lot of impact and not necessarily get funded on the back of that. And I, I'm just wondering. If that's true, and you guys are focused on designing businesses, you know, or, or this is an approach at design, why wouldn't you design that to some extent into what you're building? Um, and you know, how how do you you know, how, or how can you design that? You know, the fact that the funding is sort of, you know, not necessarily a function of impact, but potentially a function of other things. What do you, when you say design, and what do you mean? Meaning, you know, if you have this mission statement, and and you know, this whole exercise is built around delivering impact, which is important, but if at the end of the day, the funding that you're looking for to scale isn't a function of impact, is there something else that you should build into this at the front end to account for that? Yeah, well, everybody's always trying to chase the holy grail of sustainability. And in fact, we think of everybody we fund as, as a business that is losing the least amount of money possible while having the maximum impact possible. And sometimes that means you actually have you're actually in the black, which is fantastic. But we fund a lot of organizations that have a revenue stream, and they're trying to maximize that revenue stream while maximizing their impact at the same time. Or they're trying to maximize their impact while maximizing the amount of revenue they can do without threatening that impact. And they may not break even, but what it does is lower the cost per impact. I think it's kind of a sideshow. In other words, until the donor market changes, and I think it is. More people are demanding the measurement of impact. I talk to more smart donors all the time. It's, it's, I don't know if it's a sea change yet, but it's starting to ripple. So until that big thing, I mean, it'd be like trying to fix the commercial markets if people didn't invest on the basis of profit. You could tinker with it, but it'd be a mess. One last. Or not? Yes. Hi, I'm Anu Gupta from a foundation in New Jersey. Um, Kevin, you've talked a lot about the kind of stages of scalability, and and one of the things we found sometimes is organizations kind of get to that proof of concept; they they can feel it, but then they lose the discipline. They go to another country and they start kind of all over again with the R&D and they, they tinker with the model again because it's a new site. Can you talk a little bit about sort of how do you handle that when people are taking a, a very 
basic elements of a model, but then changing it so much that in collective they may have scale, but they're not having scale in any one place. Well, for one thing, the mark of a good company, a good organization is they don't follow the money. They lead the money. And so you end up, if you follow money, you end up turning your model into a mess because you actually have to please all those that you're following. And great organizations decide what they do and decide on a strategy to persuade funders to help them do it. Um, and that's the only way to keep your model intact, is to tell funders, this is what we do. If you like what we do, fund it, please. And if you don't, fund somebody else. And I know, that, I know that's just not that easy to do if you're trying to meet a payroll. I mean, I, I get that. But the truth is, the discipline to do that or not, in our experience, separates the, the bad, the good, and the great. You guys, this was fun. Thank you. <laughs>